Cool. Uh, well, thank you guys for being here, and I'm pretty excited to chat with you guys. Today, we're going to be talking about the lean startup model and uh, design thinking. Uh, show of hands, who's relatively familiar with either of those? A little bit. Anybody an expert on those? Because if so, you can come teach on it. <laughs> cool. Um, so both of these things are essentially processes um, or methodologies for how to approach building a business, building a product, or uh, iterating through a product. So if you have something that's already in production, um, it's a way in which uh, you can essentially process um, and move through your product cycle or your launch cycle. Um, it focuses mainly on making sure that you don't end up with a product that you have that's taken a really long time, costs a lot of money, used a lot of resources, and your customer doesn't really want it. Um, there's a lot of those products in the world. There's a lot of businesses that have failed, a lot of startups that have failed. One of the biggest reasons is because they build something people don't want. So tonight we're going to try and help you guys build the right thing. Um, a little bit about me, full name Leland Jake Bailey. I go by Jake. Um, a generalist by trade, so I'm a kind of a jack of all trades. I, uh, I'm an entrepreneur, have some coding and technical capabilities so I can build apps and websites, stuff like that. Uh, a little bit of a sense for design. Uh, these are some of the things that either I'm working on or have worked on. Currently, I'm at Bamboo Creative. Uh, we're a creative agency helping companies do branding, marketing, app development, web development, stuff like that. I'll go through a couple of these. Candid is a new product that I'm working on. It's kind of in early beta, meaning I have one person using it. Um, <laughs> it's basically a tool to help web, web developers collect feedback during the web development process. Book Launch is a product that I built from scratch with a team, and it coincides with Snippet. Snippet was an app to help authors um, publish short ebooks um, in a kind of a new format and deliver those right to customers. We raised venture funding for that. It's currently sunsetting because we didn't get enough traction. It's a good example of building something that customers don't really want. Book Launch spun out of that, and it's currently doing well. Uh, it's a reoccurring revenue project. Helps authors create websites for their books. Lists in the bottom left corner there, built at a hackathon from this guy. So a team of us built it in about 32 hours. It's a way to create a list of your favorite things and share them with people. Pocket Rocket's just a really simple, it's the first thing I built, a uh, way to send an article from if anybody uses Pocket. It's like an Instapaper, read it later service. Currently sends over a million emails to customers uh, every year. In addition to that, I've built the um, first business I started with a coffee shop, um, and I've also launched some restaurants. So just that's kind of my gamut of things that I've done. Uh, needless to say, I've learned a lot from that. Uh, I've had some successes, I've had some failures, um, and really the processes that we're going to talk about today are a really good tool that I've learned during some of these things of the last eight, nine years. Um, that are helping me launch more successful products as I go along. The more I implement these things, the more I take them to heart and actually apply them, uh, the higher my success rate is getting as I'm launching things. Um, so that's just some good news today. So Lean Startup, if anybody hasn't checked out the book, there's an awesome book on this by Eric Ries. Um, so I suggest you check that out and read it. Uh, what the Lean Startup is, it's basically uh, a methodology to practice um, for developing products or businesses based on validated learning, and that's emphasized for a reason, we'll get back to that. Getting customer feedback quickly and often. It often follows this loop that you see up here, uh, starting with the idea, uh, that's usually some sort of a hypothesis or solution that you might have, um, some problem that you might want to address, some idea on a new business model you, wanna, you might want to apply. The next thing is to build that. It often results in some code. It doesn't have to. Just because it says code, that's the way they usually frame it. Think of that as a build, meaning some sort of minimum viable product, something that they can ship out and put in front of people. That could be a landing page. That could be a website. That could be a, you know, an actual product that people can use. It could be a prototype. Next thing you do in this uh, process is attach some metrics to it and really measure how people use it. So put it in front of people, measure it, and gain some data and then analyze that and go constantly back through the cycle. The whole goal of this is to minimize your amount of time going from actual product to learning something, back to changing your idea, tweaking it, pivoting, learning if it's working or not, back to building something either new or tweaking what you've already built, representing that to customers, and go through this cycle as many times and as quickly as possible. This is not something where a lot of people get hung up on this. This is not something where, um, 
you do it once and you have all the answers and then you go build your product. It's not how it works. A lot of people think that's how it works or approach it in that way. This is something that if you really ingrain it in your business early uh, and you learn how to do it and go through it a ton of times, you're constantly learning, you're constantly getting closer and closer and closer to finding that right fit of your product or your business with your customer. Um, so quick touch on validated learning. Uh, validated learning is only true if you combine really three things. Um, and this whole process is really only useful if you combine three things. So validated learning means that you actually ship a real product, a real something, whether it's a landing page, whether it's a prototype you can put in somebody's hands that they can use or that's a product. It has to be something real, just, you know, just generally talking about something or uh, really loosely pitching something to somebody and getting their feedback. It's, that doesn't quantify validation. Um, the second thing is it has to go in front of real people, real customers, so not your mom, not your grandma, not your best friend. Like It's gotta go in front of people who are actually going to use it. And the third thing is that you have to actually get good data. Um, if you are skewing your data, if you're not collecting the right data, it becomes completely use useless. You can't validate whatever it is you're trying to prove or whatever you wanted to learn. So I'm gonna give you guys just a quick example of a project that, um, that I was working on recently. Uh, I had an idea for a housing startup, um, a relatively large idea when it comes to my ideas, uh, which usually hover more around web apps and tools. Um, I had a hypothesis that uh, people want, would want to live in a smaller footprint house if it was designed much to like a much higher standard. If it was a really nice, small, modern prefab home, typical American homes are getting larger and larger and larger. I thought, what if we shrunk them down, made them more affordable? and even might change the financing model on housing. So I had this really, really big, hairy idea that I didn't know what to do with, and I wanted to figure out, okay, how do I validate whether or not this is a good idea to pursue? And this is recent for me, so I'll share it with you guys. Um, so I needed to essentially get in front of customers, because I sure as heck wasn't gonna go spend $500,000 to build a house and then see if it works. Um, and the minimum viable product for a house is a tent, and I wasn't gonna go just pitch a tent and see if people wanted to live in it, because it wasn't you know, in line with the idea that I was trying to execute. So uh, what I did was essentially create a landing page. It took me two hours one night. It looked something like this. The only thing that changed was instead of that big modern affordable housing for everybody tagline, I switched to coming soon to and then insert city name, which I just did through the URL of the page. Um, so it was like coming soon to Sacramento, coming soon to Portland. And then I said, okay, well, how do I actually get people to come to this page? There's a little bit more below the page that just had the four key things. Modernly designed, smaller footprint, interesting financing model, and whatever else the other idea was. There's four things that it touched on the page. That's it. And I said, how do I drive people to this page? Well, I've got to figure out who, where are people who want to buy homes, who want to buy or rent, who are moving. How do I get in front of those people? I have zero money to spend on this, because my wife hates when I spend money on ideas that are crazy. Um, so I had zero money to spend on this, but I needed to get in front of people. I needed to get in front of as many people as possible, and I needed to learn as much as possible. So I wanted to know a couple things. Would people be interested in those four areas that I was really focused on? A different financing model, modern design, but a smaller footprint. So where those customers were, I happened upon an idea for Craigslist. People post for houses on Craigslist all the time. So I went on Craigslist, created an account, and posted in the up-and-coming suburban cities in America, including Sacramento and some others. Um, all in all, I think it took me four hours to go through and create maybe 20 posts on Craigslist. I posted simple things with you know, images that I found online. It was a fake post, so bad on me, but you know, I didn't end up hurting anybody in the search for a house. Um, and I just described kind of the key features that I really wanted for this and posted on Craigslist and saw what happened. Um, I then, when people click that sign up button, I didn't want to just have them enter you know, an email and say, yep, that's validation. I wanted to gain as much data as possible and I wanted it to be a pretty high barrier to entry. So I created a form that had maybe seven or eight fields on it, including you know, where are you currently living? House, renting, this other? How much are you currently spending? How long would you want to live here? What city do you want to live in? Like all that kind of stuff. Overall, I don't know, four hours worth of work, I got about 700 people to fill out that form. Um, and of those 700, that includes people who then followed up via email and started multiple conversations in which I've learned that like a ton about this idea. Um, this is something, that's, that's literally as far, as far as I've taken it so far. Um, but I got through that cycle within about eight hours. Mm. And, uh, and sure, it took some time to like look through that data and stuff, but getting through that, I could have spent, the traditional way to approach this is create a business plan, 
raise a ton of money, go build a house, and then find out, do people want to buy it or not? What I found out was that 700 people through Craigslist ads were willing to at least say, yeah, I want one, or when are they coming to my area? 100 people or so reached back out and were genuinely excited about the idea, including urban housing planners that stumbled upon it, like venture capitalists who were like, hey, is this a funded company, or what is this, like, that were interested in it? Like, strange things happen when you put something out there early and you want to learn about it. So it's just a quick example of how this can actually be applied. We'll go into just like the how it works step by step uh, for the Lean Startup model. So the first thing is to start with a hypothesis. Um, some sort of problem, solution, that you might think um, is the right solution for the idea. You can also hypothesis about price or go to market strategy. Um, this process is used not only for businesses on the broader scale, but also for features within products. Uh, teams like Twitter and Facebook and Instagram are using this for single features. They're going, hey, can we get more people to click this button? Um, I don't know, let's, you know, let's do it, let's measure it, let's get back to the cycle. They're, they're using the same loop to apply specific product features. Uh, and so yeah, so uh, the second thing that you're gonna do is uh, build a minimum viable product. Again, we touched on this just a little bit. Who's heard the term minimum viable product before? Cool, so uh, what that really means is you want something in which you can put in 20% of the work that leads to 80% of the customers going like, yeah, that's great. Um, you don't want a fully featured product. Like That is the biggest mistake that most of us make in our early entrepreneur days, is to build out a fully featured product and then put it in front of a customer. Most products that you see online today, you might go, they have a lot of features. If you look at co cohort analysis of those things, most of those features aren't getting used. Like 10% of those features are probably driving 80% of the, your user satisfaction. Um, so build a really minimum viable product. That can be a landing page, again, that can be a, a small version of your product, that can be um, a sketched prototype or a clickable prototype. Um, that can be a physical product that might just be stitched together from things you have in a shop like this. Um, so, but you want to keep it minimal. It's really important. Next thing is to define measurable <coughs> metrics. Um, that could be a sign up, a conversion, customer happiness in an interview, a lot of different ways to go about that. But you have to define it before you present it to customers, or else you're just going to be using um, whatever data you have to inform your own confirmation bias. We're naturally wired to confirm whatever the assumption is that we have about a situation, about a product, especially as entrepreneurs. We love our ideas, and we really, really love to look at the data and find that other people love our ideas, even if that's not true. Um, so define ahead of time some sort of measurable metric that you can track, get that tracking in place, present it to customers, um, and start gathering that data. Analyze those results. Important thing here is to be really brutally honest. Do not love your idea so much that you're not willing to pivot, that you're not willing to change it, that you're not willing to uh, you know, move on from it even. Um, look, at the, look at the data with you know, fresh eyes and really analyze it um, and see what the results are. Last step is just to repeat. Go through the cycle over and over and over again. You can do it as many times as you want. Um, and it becomes more and more useful the more you do it. Any initial questions on like Lean Startup? We'll move on to design thinking. Yeah? I presume you have to run multiple concurrent tests if, in fact, you're locked to an external schedule, like an annual schedule, and you don't want to wait a year for each cycle. Yeah, I, I mean, these when we're talking about these cycles, like especially early on, like we should be getting through these in days. Um, we're going to go through what I handed out, which is a way to do something similar within a 45-minute session with a customer. Um, but yeah, I mean, you really want to get through these quickly. Okay. An annual cycle would be a terrible way, I think, to launch a business. So, in terms okay, so of, yeah. really we're talking about two alternatives. One, you could run multiple tests with multiple variations of the product mm -hmm. in a single external cycle. Or you could step away from that more real external cycle and use some Something else, some other metric. Yeah, I mean, I would if uh, in terms of like, is it is the external Let's cycle say you fixed? Have a, a Christmas product. Yeah, you you can only sell it for real at yeah. Christmas, but yeah, but during that, so every other season, uh, you can be testing Christmas products. You can get a group of people together. Uh, it, depending on the product, uh, I mean, you can get people's feedback on a Christmas product at any time of the year. Uh, the idea is to. To, if you're fixed to a certain sales point, the idea would be dur during off seasons to be iterating constantly on whatever the product is, so that when that sales point comes around or that external fixed date comes around, 
you have a product that people actually want to buy. Rather than going, once a year I've got a chance at this, uh, you're going, okay, I know because of all of this iteration going through this uh, lean startup model, I know that this product that I'm going to put out is going to be successful, or it has a higher chance of being successful. Any other? Yeah. So that whole story sounded very smooth, and yeah. um, was that because you would have done that uh, quite a few times, or was that like your second time doing that? Um, no, I mean, I've done this process a number of times, especially the landing page version where you're trying to convert people. The biggest reason that that's, that process was a success for that idea was because of the way I went about like finding customers. Because I could find a channel in which it was easy to access customers and get in front of them, um, it was a lot easier to you know get an actual result that I could measure. One of the harder things is going like, you know, is finding a thousand people who are even interested in your idea. So um, you have to be really creative. We'll spend some time at the end of this, hopefully brainstorming some ideas for um, finding customers. So minimal viable product has to be functional. Uh, how much percentage has to be functional? Um, it depends what your hypothesis is. Did you repeat that louder? Yeah, so he said, does the minimum viable product have to be functional? It depends what your hypothesis is. If your product is, um, is something where the business model is more the innovation than the product, then no, it doesn't have to be at all because you can go take a piece of paper prototype to somebody or a clickable design prototype and say, hey, here's this whole thing. Guess what? The business model is this. Instead of you know, buying a house, you're leasing a house, whatever it is, instead of you know, paying for this annually, you're going to pay for it monthly and it's cheaper or whatever, um, you can test that hypothesis. If your hypothesis is um, something more around the solution, um, the closer you can get to the, the higher fidelity, the better it's going to be. But again, you want to be getting through this cycle. So if you can cut away features mm -hmm. and still um, find an answer to your question or to your hypothesis and learn from it, the better. Um, so get it out there earlier, the earlier the better. So my question is, um, somewhere I saw online that there are some platforms where you can test products, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a number of services out there where you can, yeah. that are, again, creative ways to get in front of customers. Um, uh -huh. We've used a number of them before. Uh, there's, uh, I forget what it's called, it's beta, uh, there's beta list, which yeah. is essentially a service that'll send out your product to a, for 79 bucks, so you can do it like within a day. Yeah. Um, there's a ton of those kind of things, but um, we'll cover a little bit more finding customers at the end. Okay. Cool. Um, so next we'll jump into design thinking. So uh, design thinking is really similar um, to the Lean Startup model, uh, and there's going to be a lot of overlap, uh, but there's kind of one key differentiator. Um, the first you'll notice is this is a little bit more linear process. It's not meant to go through over and over again, although you can. Um, it's typically used in a more linear fashion. Um, where it overlaps the most is from idea phase down to testing. Um, it's pretty similar to the startup model. <coughs> the lean startup model. So design thinking matches people's needs with what is technologically feasible and what a viable business strategy can convert into customer value and market opportunity. <coughs> so the biggest difference here is it matches people's needs. They front load a ton of the uh, customer uh, interviews and a ton of the um, really the getting to know who is going to be using this before they build anything. So design thinking um, starts with empathy. So this is about deeply understanding your customer. This is before you build absolutely anything. This is not just writing out some sort of persona, you know, I'm targeting you know, soccer moms in their 30s to 40s in suburban cities, whatever. Like that's really, really generic. This is about really deeply understanding your customer. How do you do that? The main thing um, is to live in their shoes as much as possible. If you're building a, you know, a thing for Uber or Lyft, drive for Uber or Lyft. Like that is your best way to get insights, to feel their pains, to get to know, <coughs> to get to know people. Sorry. <coughs> My voice is cutting off. <coughs> so if you want to build something for restaurants, uh, you know, go get a job at a restaurant. Uh, immerse yourself in whatever it is you're building. If you're building something for uh, 
for the cannabis industry, you know, get to know some people. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, that's not, 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 not. Um, the other way to do this is through uh, customer interviews, which we're going to talk a little bit more about, uh, which is just talking to customers. You really have to internalize and feel the pain that this person, uh, that this customer, that this user has. I'm going to try to talk a little quieter so my voice doesn't go off. The second thing is to clearly state the problem. So through talking with people, through um, getting immersed in the problem um, and in their lives, you want to then clearly state what the problem is. So it, it, the problem statements typically focus around this user needs this thing, and here's my insight about that need. Um, it becomes super useful because this is what your team is going to rally behind. This is what you're going to rally behind. This is what you're going to pitch investors, is that I am out to fix this big, big problem. The only way you're going to get a really, really great problem statement is by really understanding the problem, really understanding the customer and what their needs are. The next thing is to generate a ton of solutions. One of the things about the design thinking process that differs from the Lean Startup model is Lean Startup model typically starts with, I have this idea of how to solve this problem, whereas design thinking typically goes, I have an idea, but I acknowledge that my idea is not the answer. Um, and first, I'm going to talk to customers and see what their problems really are. Um, when we run design thinking processes with companies, um, we typically get approached with, hey, help us solve this problem. And we say, you don't know what your real problem is. <laughs> and they're always like, oh, really? And we go, yeah, let us do some interviews. Let us like work with your team. Let us get to know what you're actually doing. And then when we get to the definition of the problem phase, they're always amazed. They go, how the heck did you guys figure that out? And I'll give you an example of that in just a few minutes. But at this point, you should have a really clear problem that you want to solve, and then you can think about a ton of different ways to solve it. So I'll give you just a quick example of a problem statement. Um, as early entrepreneurs, that is you guys, uh, you need a way to quickly learn and fail often. Um, and so, you know, rather than going, the solution is start a hustle. We go, hey, uh, early entrepreneurs, uh, we need a way to learn and fail often so that we don't end up wasting all of our time and resources and energy building a product nobody loves. There's a lot of solutions to that. One of them is Startup Hustle. One of them could be an online course. One of them could be some sort of mentorship program. One of them could be, I, I don't know. But the point is, is that once you have a problem statement, it should be big enough in which a ton of ideas, a ton of solutions can be presented to that problem. Um, and that's good, because you don't want to think that your idea is the only idea to solve that problem. Oftentimes, there's a ton of different ways to go about it, ways that you might not have thought about um, previously. Next thing is to prototype. This is really simil similar to the minimum viable product. It's even typically thought of as being um, a less, um, a less uh, fidelity version of that. Um, so a lot of times, this is sketching on a piece of paper and then showing it to somebody. Um, but you want to try to prototype something and then test it and get real feedback. So what we do typically is um, in our, when we're building a business or a product like you guys are, with clients a lot of times we do the design thinking process. When we do our own stuff, we kind of mash the two together and I'll walk you guys through this. Um, around our office, somebody walks in just about every day and says, I've got an idea for a new business or a new product and that's great. Um, what we initially do is go back to the empathy part. So we go, hey, let's understand who would actually use this. Why would people use this? Is this a terrible idea or a good idea? We have no idea at this point. Um, it might sound really cool, but we don't know. So we go back and we try to understand what the actual need is there um, before we jump into building the first step. Once we have some empathy and feel like we have a good idea, we define whatever that problem statement is. Once we define it, we come up with some sort of idea. It might be the original idea that, we can't, that somebody walked in the office with. It might be something completely different. The NMVS is our version of uh, the minimum viable products. Um, it's the next minimum viable step. Um, that could be creating a landing page. That could be uh, jotting down some stuff on a piece of paper or pitching taglines. A lot of times it's us calling up uh, potential customers, people that we've identified as somebody who might use this, and just talking to them and like asking them an interview style question and gathering some feedback. Um, it is whatever that next step is that, um, that you can actually put in front of customers. It doesn't have to be a full product. Um, a lot of times it's surveys. Um, so we will send out surveys to potential customers and just gather information back. That's the next minimum viable step. 
Um, we ship that, we actually get it in front of customers, we measure the result, and then we tweak whatever our, uh, whatever our definition of the problem is, or we continue on and go to the next minimum viable step. We really build products and build businesses in baby steps. Um, the old way to do it was huge leaps, um, and that creates a lot of risk. If you don't have a lot of money, which I don't think a lot of us do, uh, <laughs> if you don't have a lot of money, and maybe you don't have a lot of time, and maybe you don't have a lot of resources, the best way to go about building a product or a business is in baby steps. Um, so this human-centered design interview is one of those baby steps that I just provided for you guys to take a look at today. Cool. Um, so any questions, actually I'll just go back to, uh, go back to this one. Any questions on the design thinking process before we jump into uh, human-centered design stuff? So Typically not. Uh, we really don't believe strongly in NDAs. Um, if there's, unless you're building some top secret military weapon, uh, like uh, yeah, I mean the the idea that people somebody's gonna steal your idea is is just not it's not likely. Um, and yeah, I, it very very rarely happens. There's a lot of fear in entrepreneurs that their idea is gonna get stolen. Mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is, is like your idea is probably not as unique as you think it is, and the only thing that's gonna separate you is execution. Like I'm guaranteed that who, all of your ideas have been thought of by somebody else somewhere else in the world and are being executed. Some of them being executed right now. The only thing that matters is how quickly and how efficiently and how well you can execute on that idea. Yeah. Kind of going off that, when does your idea become yours? Like, when is, like, yeah. do you understand what I'm saying? A little bit, like when to take the leap of faith, or? Well, like, no, like, when does it become your trademark? Um, yeah, so a lot of times we're running lean startup processes, we're running this kind of uh, cycle before we've ever formed a company, before we ever write a line of code, before we've ever created a business plan or hired a team. This is stuff because you should be doing it so quickly and because it should not cost a lot and because um, it's really, it's a lower fidelity version of whatever your big idea is. Um, and you shouldn't necessarily be in the trademark like okay. patent, unless you have something that's seriously patentable, um, then you should really be focused on learning and less on trademark, less on competition less on funding, less on that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, those kind of those things come much later in the, the kind of organizational process. Cool. How do you know when you have a significant a statistically significant sample of uh, people you talk to? I mean yeah. you can talk to a hundred people but if they all look the same, they might have driven you off a cliff. Yeah, exactly. So you have to watch out for false negatives and false positives. Um, but how do, you, how do you ensure you got that? Yeah, a lot of it is kind of like your entrepreneurial gut will tell you that. Um, but, I mean, through looking at the data, like, be honest with it. Does it seem like everybody's just saying, like, yeah, great product idea, um, but, you know, are, can you get them, what's the next minimum vi viable step from that? So if everybody says, hey, that's great, can you say, hey, will you pay, you know, $50 for it right now? You know, and actually, if it's a reoccurring product, um, get people to put money on it. Like, build the next smaller version that they can actually pay for it. Um, you have to figure out how to constantly up that validation with the customer. That's one of the best ways to do it. Um, it's because if you have 100 people saying, yeah, I love this product, uh, but then you come back to that same 100 and say, hey, it's, it's, you know, I've got the next version ready for you. You might be doing it manually on the back end. You might be you know, hacking it together. Um, and you say, hey, will you pay you know, $100 for this? And they go, 50 of them say no. Like maybe you know, it's not as great of a positive as you thought it was. Uh, so yeah, you have to constantly kind of be upping the ante with your validation. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, I guess sort of. I mean, kind of thing in our in our business, we uh, we found that the demographics here in Sacramento are different than ones in LA. Yeah. Actually, like, so. Yeah. So if you're worried about that, if you're worried about you know uh, maybe your product is too localized, yeah, then get out, go down to LA, go to other areas, and, and do the, run the same test. Yeah. Line up interviews ahead of time. Do them via Skype, like, um, and try to collect as much data from there as possible. Figure out ways to get in front of other people. Um, if you're talking to, you know, the same type of group of people, then yeah, like, if uh, try to get outside of that. For sure. Cool. 
so human centered design interview. This is a way in which you can you can run through this process. I gave you guys a handout. Uh, there might be a typo in there. Sorry. Uh, but we've run through this a ton with clients. Um, it's just basically a way to get through that cycle, one full loop, uh, within about 45 minutes. We do this all the time. Uh, it's terrifying and awkward, and it'll really test your creativity. Um, but I'd highly suggest you do it, or at least steal some things from it. So the first thing is an initial interview. Um, this is where like it's 10, 15 minutes um, just talking to a customer. There's a couple key things that I wanted to pull out and talk about in terms of um, how to conduct interviews. So the first thing is just to be prepared. Have some questions that you really want answered. Have some sort of you know direction you want the conversation to go, um, and and jot those down. Have those kind of off to the side. Um, but the second thing is totally counter to that, which is just have a conversation. Like, don't come in with like, hey, here are the five questions I want to ask you. Okay, we're done. That's not how you get really good customer feedback. It should be them talking at least three to four times as much as you are. Um, if you're getting answers like yes and no, you're asking the wrong questions or you're not asking that question the right way. You want people to be telling you stories. <coughs> you want them to basically be talking about the last time they dealt with whatever the problem is that you're presenting. Um, you don't want to be presenting your solution. You don't want to come in and say, hey, I've got this bottle of water. What do you think of it? They'll go. It's, it's great, it looks nice. <laughs> you want to go, hey, uh, tell me about the last time you were thirsty. <laughs> what was that like? How did you feel? What, how did you solve that problem? What did you do? You know, why did you pick that brand when you were thirsty? Oh, you like the look of it. Cool. Like, you, you want to get them talking as much as possible, not about your solution, but about whatever problem, whatever feelings they had, whatever they were facing when that came up. During this initial interview, you want to be finding threads to pull on. Be taking notes, be highlighting your notes, because the next thing you're going to do is dig deeper. When he said, hey, uh, you know, I was thirsty and I went to the store. It's like, great, how'd you get to the store? Like, ask more questions, dive into it deeper. Maybe that's where a water delivery service would come in handy. I doubt it, but that's a good idea, trademark. Um, you want to find threads that you can dive deeper into and get them to talk more about. Ask why, uh, ask why again, ask why again. Like keep diving deeper until you really feel like you have a good understanding of whatever the problem is that they had. Um, the next thing is uh, define the needs and capture the insights. Uh, that's a pretty easy step. All you're doing is jotting down what that person needed uh, when they were telling you about their problem. Um, and capturing insights. What are some thoughts that you had right off the bat on um, that stuck out to you? These are things that are starting to shape your point of view on their problem. The, last, the next thing is to create a problem statement. This is probably one of the more important steps. Um, again, I'll just touch on this a little bit. Uh, you have to balance making it clear um, with still providing some inspiration. This should be like the formational thing on which you're gonna launch all of your solutions out of. Um, this should be what rallies a team, if you have a team, or what makes you really passionate about the idea. Um, you don't want one that is so broad that it's going to serve everybody. Um, for instance, the problem statement for something like Instagram is not, you know, users need a way to share more photos because sharing photos is fun. Like, that's not it. Like, early on, it was probably something like users, you know, feel like their photos don't look good. Like, that was more the problem that they were solving than sharing photos. Sharing photos happened to be a good way to make people feel better about the photography that they were taking. Um, but it needs to really inspire people. It needs to focus on whatever that customer pain point is. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, how do you, like, what's the strategy you use to solicit an interview? So, like, yeah. when you're asking somebody, like, I want to interview you about, you have your idea, right? Yeah. And how do you like, get around it without saying, like, this is my, like, idea and I want to talk to you about it without yeah. saying, like, this is the solution I have? Don't, don't even start with your solution or your idea that you want to talk about. Uh -huh. Say, hey, uh, would you mind if I came in and you told me about your business? Make it about them sharing something with you rather than you presenting them with something. Nobody wants to be pitched. Nobody wants to be sold something. Like, mm -hmm. It's just the reality of it. If you say, hey, I want to come in and show you this thing that someday I'm going to want to charge you money for or someday you know, I'm going to want you to, to use and pay for, yeah. it becomes very like, I don't really know what I'm getting myself into. Uh -huh. um, but if you go, hey, you know, I'm working on something new. Uh, would you mind telling me about the last time like you had this experience? Would you mind telling me about uh, you know spending ten to fifteen minutes just describing what you do or what your process is? If it's an enterprise solution, it's, it becomes much easier to go. Hey, 
I want to learn more about about the restaurant that you're running, or I want to learn more about uh, HR. Would you mind if I came in and just asked you a couple questions about the, how you're managing your payroll? Like, use use your own like early entrepreneur like uh, insignificance to your own benefit. Like, if it's a payroll product, be like, hey, I'm starting a new business. I was wondering how you run payroll. Like, you can be a little stupid behind it, and you know, it gets to the point which you're like. Yeah, you know that's really interesting. Like, so our product, you know, has to do with payroll. Like, and like, kind of lead the witness to some extent, but don't like, don't start off trying to pitch whatever it is you have. Yeah. Kind of to piggyback off of what he's asking, because I know my target audience would be students, mm -hmm. and what I, what I find a problem with that would be is. I, like I'm a student right now, of course, and yeah. uh, when I walk through campus, I hate when anybody tries to come and talk to me. Yeah. So, I mean, I can definitely see that it being a problem of me trying to yeah. interact with people on campus. You know where else students hang out? Bars. <laughs> Go to bars and just talk to people. Like, don't approach somebody when they're walking to class and when they're trying to get home. Like, coffee shops. Like, other places. And just be like, hey, I noticed, you know, you're using your phone. Like, could I talk to you for a minute about, you know about what you're doing, like, okay. I don't know exactly what your products are, so it, it's a little hard exactly. for me to give you a specific thing, but find other places in which your customer are where they're not so guarded or where they might be more willing to talk to you. Yeah. 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 All right, so the next thing is to generate solutions. We talked a little bit about that. Uh, so once you've got that really crystal clear uh, problem statement, you go into just generating uh, as many solutions. This is all done within, again, 45 minutes. So. You're sitting there doing an interview. If you can run it this way, this is awesome. Um, say, hey, you got 30, 45 minutes. Great. Um, take, go from step one to step two and then say, hey, I'm going to take a couple notes and gather my thoughts. Would you mind just sitting and hanging out for five, ten minutes while, uh, and I'll be back? Go uh, and define your needs. Create your problem statement really quick. This puts you on the spot, like your time box, essentially, trying to come up with something. Generate solutions, and I was supposed to bring some examples, and I didn't, so sorry. Um, I'll talk about some examples, I guess. Um, so you're literally, in, in this human center design, you have five boxes to create five different ways in which you could solve that problem. Um, and then you can address that problem statement. You then take that back to whoever you're interviewing and say, hey, so we talked about this stuff. Um, it was super useful. I really feel like the problem that you described to me was this. Here are some ways in which, you know, uh, in which I think would be really cool to solve that problem that you have. Present that back to them and talk them through each one of those problems or each one of those solutions and have them tell you what they like, what they don't like. Um, have them pick out their favorite, tell you why it's their favorite. Make them talk about it. They'll say things like, that's really cool, but I, that, like, I would never do that. Or they'll say, that's really awesome. Like, I never thought of doing it that way. Um, it's incredibly awkward and scary. I will be completely honest with you. Every time we do this with a client, every time we do this for our own ideas, like talking to people, Generating ideas on the fly, creating problem statements, like it can be really, really um, intense. But uh, the feedback that gets generated from them is incredibly useful. And you're getting it within such a short period of time that you can really compound like your efforts. And if you do it with a few other people that might be on your team, it becomes really, really, really powerful. Uh, the last thing on this, which sometimes we do, uh, we, we'll take away and we'll do later, is we reflect and we try to generate a final idea. We take whatever they like best about the thing that we had and we just kind of sketch out a general idea. Any questions? So when you generate solutions, yeah. you have to kind of know if they're technologically feasible or not? Yeah. To some extent, you should all have that domain knowledge on the idea that you're working on. And if you don't, then you find something that does. Yeah. I mean, typically we're using this stuff for physical products, um, improvements to processes, so services that might improve processes, web apps, mobile apps, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, if you're talking about like a hardcore engineering problem, which it sounds like your startup might be a little bit more in that direction, if you don't have that immediate technical capability to provide solutions on the fly like that, again, take every one of these things with a grain of salt. So. You might find that generating ideas like on the fly with a customer is not great for you know you as a founder or for the type of business or the type of product that you're creating. These are just ways, these are processes in which you should be thinking about the entire time that you're doing stuff. Um, so take some of this, leave some of this, use it how you will. The whole idea is to get in front of customers as early as possible, get feedback from them, change your idea, tweak it, sculpt it, make it better, get it back in front of them, as many times as possible so that you know that you're building something that in the end people will buy. It's no fun building stuff that people don't use. Trust me, I've done it. 
So I'm an Uber, well, I was an Uber driver, I got kicked off the app. But anyway, I'm a Lyft driver now, <laughs> and I've had over a thousand rides, probably maybe like more, 1,600 rides. And I've asked at least 400 of my riders and some, a lot of drivers, because um, I, I ask them all the time, like every time I get in the car, you know, we just start talking. Yeah. And then I will ask them and say, hey, you know, what are your biggest, you know, pet yeah. peeves with, you know, ride sharing? And, you know, they'll tell me. So I've been, that's what I'm basing my business on is yeah. all these people telling me what they want and everything. And then people have given me ideas. And I'm like, oh, thanks. Get out of the car because I don't want to have to pay you any money. <laughs> but um, so the thing is, is that the only thing is that, you know, I'm driving, so I, I'm not, I didn't record those things, yeah. but I mean, you know, as soon as I get home or whatever, I write them. So I mean, how would I, like, I mean, you know, what I'm trying to say is that, is that legitimate? Um, that's, that, I mean, that's anecdotal uh, at best, uh, okay. I would say. Like, it's good. It's good that people are telling you stuff, but um, I would say figure out what the next minimum viable step is, figure out how you can measure that, and then go through the cycle again. Um, it's really great to sit sit with somebody and you know as you're driving get some feedback. Um, what I found is that generally everybody will say your idea is good. They'll say yeah that's really cool that sounds interesting. Um, when in reality either they're not interested or uh, they don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> which is kind of harsh. But um, so yeah, I would figure out you know if are you trying to your customer is Uber drivers and Lyft drivers. My customers are drivers. Yeah. And riders, of course. Okay. The, mainly the drivers. Yeah. Know. So I figure out like from what you've heard, is there any threads that are like um, that are more prevalent than others? If you, let's say your product's going to do ten things that, to help Uber drivers, is there one that you could do in some way really quickly um, and and validate, or is there one that you could do manually um, and and without building any technology, without doing anything? A lot of great startups have started on spreadsheets. Um, and instead of databases, and so is there a way for you to do something manually to help them to get them, uh, you know, using a part of your service um, rather than building out the whole thing for them? Yeah, I think. Well, I think one of the quickest things that I can do is just create a platform for them to complain or talk about their problems. Yeah. And so that's what I want to do. That's my. That's what I'm working on now. Is great. Just like the, it's called Profit Drivers Lab, and okay. just kind of. Uh, engaging drivers to talk about their problems, yeah. you know, and their challenges, and because we don't have a platform like that. That's, and I'm thinking maybe like a daily podcast or something for yeah. an hour. So, uh, like just right off the bat, I would go like, okay. what can you do to see if people actually want to share their frustrations? Okay. Get some business cards printed, or print out some. You know, go to a space like this, print out some business cards with either text this number or call this number, okay. and give them to every Uber and Lyft driver that you have, and see if they use them. See if you get any phone calls or any texts. I have a list of 149,000 drivers. Cool. So like, I would, I mean, I would maybe go a little smaller sample size, <laughs> uh, but like, yeah, give them something that they can actually do. Because right now they're just telling you what they'd like to do. Give them something they have to take action on. Okay. Um, and then see if anybody takes action, and if they don't. Circle back with them. Say, hey, uh, I dropped your card. Is everything going great, or have you not used it? Like, what's the deal? Um, and just ask. Like, one of the hardest things to do is just to ask, um, and just to ask people to either do something or to give you feedback on what you just tried to get them to do. So. Cool. So I'll share a little bit about. Um, we just ran through this for Zocalo. So I don't know how many people are familiar with Zocalo. It's a local restaurant. Great food. Uh, good client of ours. Um, so they came to us with hey, will you guys make us some training videos? Because we're having a hard time uh, with employees getting trained up to the level we want them to be. We're having a high level of turnover. We are, um, we're having issues with managers having to spend too much time with, uh, with employees during training. So we want some new training videos. Will you guys do that for us? And we said, no, we won't. We won't shoot you new training videos. What we'll do is run this process um, to figure out what's some better ideas than just creating new training videos. Because they've done training videos in the past. I think every restaurant does training videos. We want to say, what are some better solutions um, than just charging you guys money and making some videos? So um, we gathered, there's a lot of different players in uh, the training process. There are the new hire who is just coming on board. There's existing employees who are floating around who have to help. There are managers. Um, and so we gathered a group of all of those. 
um, individually. We had like a day in which we came in and we did this in one day. Sat them down for 30, 45 minutes and just kind of asked some questions like, hey, you know, uh, you're new here, like, what's it feel like? You know, how, how do you, how'd you feel on your first day? Uh, we asked the same thing of people who had been there for years. Hey, remember back to when you were hired, like, what was that experience like? What stuck out to you? What made you feel good about it? Like, what were you worried about when you got, like, what are you worried about right now? Ask managers, like, what's the most frustrating part of your day? Like, what's the most frustrating part of training? Uh, and we just honestly just started having these conversations in which we were just kind of inundated with all of this, these stories of people talking about how, like, yeah, I, you know, I've been here for three days. I just kind of wander around. Like, I don't really know what to do. Nobody's telling me, like, where to go. Like, and, like, that's a huge problem. Like, that's a huge <laughs> problem in the training process. Um, and they just wanted to have some more, like, videos. So it was completely unrelated to, like, their, per their perceived solution. Um, by just talking to people, we just dug out as much as we could. And then we sketched out ideas. We came up with ideas like, hey, what if you, uh, you have, like, an individual mentor that guides you through the process? Like, if you're one, you know, trainee, <laughs> trainer, relationship. You can call them, you can text them, like whatever. We had ideas where like if you're just floating around the restaurant, like maybe you have a checklist that you have to go through. Like ideas of what if there's a platform on which you have to do some stuff at home, some stuff uh, in the restaurant. What if there's one on your very first day, you get a Zocalo box in which like it comes with your apron, it makes you feel a part of the team. Like we thought of, hey, literally we pitched the idea of on your first day, Everybody circles around the bar and takes a shot of tequila. Yeah. And people are like, that is so awesome. And like, because that's Zocalo's brand. Like, they are very about family, and they are very about tequila. And honestly, they have entire staff meetings where they start with a shot of tequila. So to welcome you, why not shot, start with a shot of tequila? It makes you feel like part of the team. Like, uh, so it's things like that that were like, that's a really small change to their training process. Uh, but they were not thinking about that. What was that? When did you do that? Because you must have done it recently. They have so many, because I'm a driver. Yeah. That place is packed, seriously, like yeah. all the time. We've been but working it wasn't with, like that. Yeah, we've been working with Zocalo for the last two years, probably, two yeah. and a half years. Yeah, you're doing a great job. So yeah, we just launched a new website for them. Wow. Uh, we've done some training processes. We've done a lot of different stuff. Um, but this was the one that was most fun for me, uh, to get really hands-on into not some sort of new technology solution, but into problems that people were facing uh, and to really internalize those problems. I've owned restaurants, coffee shops, I've tried to solve this problem myself, so to get paid to solve it is really fun. Uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, we generated as many ideas as possible, we showed them those sketches, like we titled the ideas, um, we showed them the sketches, and we took that away and we generated some, a really cool user story for how new trainees could be onboarded. Um, and it included a ton of our ideas, and so far it's been significantly successful for them. So. Um, that's just one example of, of how we're kind of using this process. So if nothing else, I'm just going to kind of wrap stuff up and then we can do some, uh, some time for you guys to do some brainstorming um, and we'll work through another exercise. Um, if nothing else, the first thing to take away is don't be afraid to talk to customers. Um, the biggest mistake that I see entrepreneurs making is just being fearful. Um, fearful of putting your idea out there, fearful of competition fearful of having this insurmountable task of building a business in front of you, um, and fearful, honestly, of just talking to people. Like, it's something that our culture, I think, really struggle, struggles with. Um, it's something I struggle with, like, just starting a conversation with somebody and sharing your idea or trying to learn about something, somebody and their problems can be incredibly awkward. It can be scary. They can say, hey, you're a weirdo, get away from me. Um, <laughs> like, but you have to just be talking to people. Talk to, even if they, you don't know that they're customers, if they're potential users, start conversations and talk about your, um, talk about the problem that you want to solve, get them talking, um, and, and try to learn as much as possible. Don't be afraid to start conversations. Don't be afraid to put yourselves out there. The second thing is to make your problem crystal clear. So I'll share a little bit about Snippet, because Snippet was a, was a product that we actually raised about half a million dollars for. We were part of a startup accelerator in Sacramento. Uh, there's a team, about three or four of us, that worked on the idea. The whole idea was we it was centered around people aren't really reading books that much anymore, uh, but we're still consuming a lot of content. So can we make something between a blog and a book um, that's really media rich, that's quick to read, um, and that you know authors can write quicker, readers can read quicker, and it's like a really fun experience. Um, we never really defined like that was a decent summary of what we were trying to do, but we were never really defined a clear problem that the authors had and a clear problem that the readers had. Readers really didn't care that much that they weren't reading. Like, if you ask, if you ask generally, like, they just didn't care that they weren't reading. They feel like they're reading enough articles, they feel like they're doing lots of other stuff, so we never really defined, like, a great problem that we were solving for those readers. For authors, we tried a lot of different problems. We said, hey, it's quicker to write, but then they were like, well, I have to create all this media for it, too. So, like, 
we didn't define a clear problem for authors either. And honestly, we, I don't know, we got 17,000 readers, we got 5,000 authors, we you know, generated some income through it, so we had something going, but the problem was not clear enough, the problem was not a big enough pain for both of those people that, that we could sustain that and keep it going. So um, think about the problem that you're solving, making it clear, but also realize that uh, the product that you're making is either a painkiller or a vitamin. We talk a lot about that, those types and that scale of pain. Are you making a vitamin that somebody is like, yeah, I'll take this once a day, but it's not that important. Uh, maybe I forget to take it for a week and I don't really care. Like, I don't notice. My body doesn't change. Or are you creating something that somebody is going, gosh, I have the worst headache in the world. I need something now. I need something to fix this pain of mine. What type of product are you guys creating? Are you guys creating something that people really, really, really need to where the problem and the pain that they're facing is significant? Or are you creating something that people are just going to be like, that's great. It would be useful, but you know, I'm not really going to use it all the time or I'm not really that interested. The third thing is uh, don't overcomplicate your MVP. The, m the more I can iterate, uh, say this, the better I think. Uh, early on, ship something to customers that sucks. Ship it and be embarrassed about it. Get it in front of them and get their feedback. Uh, if, you, if you can, like you should be absolutely embarrassed <laughs> with your first version of your product. Look back at the first version of just about anybody's product. Uh, if you look back at Facebook, their homepage looks terrible. It still looks terrible. Uh, <laughs> but look back at any like any product, and you'll realize that you know what they didn't really launch uh, any new product back in the day. Sure, they launched some things that were really polished, but that was a different, uh, a really really different environment for startups. Really different business environment and a different way to approach things. If you can create a business plan and go raise five million dollars off of a business plan, that's great. Go do that. Most VCs, most angel investors aren't operating that way now. They want to know that you have 10 customers lined up. They want to see that you have great feedback. They want to see that 1,000 people signed up on a landing page. They want to see that your crappy version has 100 people actively using it every day. That is what matters nowadays, not some great plan. So don't overcomplicate whatever you're putting out there. Get it out there, get it in front of people, and learn from it. The last thing is be honest and accurate with measuring results. Um, we're really, really tied to our, our ideas. We really, really like to sugarcoat things. Um, entrepreneurs are will look at a data set and go, yeah, that looks great, when in reality it doesn't. Um, so be brutally honest with yourself, with your team, um, and, and really, really consider whether or not the results that you've got um, are worth moving forward on, are worth tweaking your idea, um, and make sure they're accurate. So if anybody wants to hit me up, I'm on Twitter, mostly. Uh, that's more than email or anywhere else, I'm on Twitter. Uh, or you guys can email me, check out my website, whatever. So that's all I got. Any questions? We'll do a couple more questions and then we'll jump into doing some brainstorming around where you guys can find customers. Is that um, going to be available to us? That's I'll share this deck with you guys in the Slack channel. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I don't have any cards, sorry. <laughs> yeah. The last thing you mentioned about authors and readers yeah. sounds a lot like the uh, wiki. Like Wiki? Yeah, so um, i trying to think. There's a lot of competition in space. Publishing is a really, really large space. Um, a lot of books get published every year. There's a ton of money in it. Um, and every person that's tried to navigate like traditional publishing to like, digital publishing has pretty much failed, um, with the exception of Amazon and Kindle, uh, because they have a massive marketplace behind it. But um, yeah, like if you look at, if anybody's familiar with Oyster, awesome, they're the Netflix of books. Awesome experience, tons of books in there, folded up and died in the last like, year. Um, if you look at companies like Inkling is doing really well, they focus on education. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, we, we, built, we built a product. Uh, we, and honestly, we built a product before we defined the pain. And so we spent a ton of money, we spent a ton of resources, and then we realized, oh crap, we're building something nobody really wants. And so that's when we actually pivoted to book launch because we had some people that we could talk to and we were listening to them and rather than them going like, you know, I want to create a shorter book or I don't want to spend so much time, you know, writing my book, they were going, I can't freaking sell my book. Right. Like I'm having a hard time getting people online to find my book and getting people to buy my book. And so we said, okay, well we'll help you create websites. That's where we started. We got a small group in Sacramento, about ten authors together, and we showed them like a design file of a landing page and said, hey, would any of you love to have this? Like, and had them like talk about, before we showed them that, we had them talk a ton about like what their experience selling their books was, what their 
current websites look like, what their frustrations were. And we said, cool, here's a design of something we're thinking about. Would any of you love to have this? And within that small group right there, we had like three or four people be like, I would pay you right now $500 to make that for me. And we were like, okay, cool, that's $500 for one page wasn't our business model. But we said, awesome, somebody's willing to pay us money just to do this. And we actually did do that for a few people where we said, awesome, let's, this is a, again, before we build out some products where they can create the pages and drag and drop the sections and, and add text and change colors and upload images, why don't we just build three or four of these just as straight HTML pages, which is really quick for us, um, and give them to customers and have them use them, see what they think. What are they gonna wanna change? What are they frustrated with? What still doesn't work for them? What sections, do they wanna capture emails? Do they want to have people share their book? So we really, that was a really uh, a process in which we really tried to pivot from something that we failed miserably at in terms of defining a problem to we found a problem within the same space and focus on that. Right. That one kind of an NPR cool. podcast or some kind of podcast. I heard about you guys. Uh, we were on. We've been on a couple like uh, for snippet. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, for snippet. So yeah. So we were on. Yeah, we were on NPR. We were on the. I, it's not the Hannity show. That's Sean Hannity. Uh, we were on. Mark Haney, I think, is his name. He was a local radio show. This one's that. Cool. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. How much more um, will you be involved in? Because yeah, you're so awesome. <laughs> thanks. Uh, yeah, so I'll try to show up to as many of these as I can. Um, if you guys are on Slack, I'm on Slack every day because of my job, because I love Slack. Uh, I'd be happy to just like DM me in there and just say, hey, I got a question for you, or uh, you help me with this. I'll try to help as much as possible. I have two young kids and I work a ton, so <laughs> I'll try to help as much as possible. We also have them on week four. Yeah, we'll be back to do one more of these too. We'll talk more about landing page design, conversion, um, and some stuff like that. So that was fun. On Slack, I'm on there as Leland Jacob. Uh, what, uh, whatever the, the Hacker hustle Lab team. Startup Hustle one. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so uh, what we're doing now is, is try to get you guys, because I think your goal for this next week is to actually talk to 10 customers. So, uh, so what we're going to have you guys do, you know, if you come back, uh, I'll try to be here next week. If you guys come back and say, I talked to 100 customers, I'm going to be like so stoked for you. The more the better. 10 is, a, 10 is a low bar. If you can't find 10 customers, to go talk to, like you might want to think about changing your idea. Like <laughs> right. you should be able to talk to uh, at least ten people about your idea, um, and it might take banging down some doors. It might take putting yourself out there. It might take cold emailing, cold calling, do whatever you have to. But you got to get in front of customers. So uh, what we're gonna do is maybe break off into like little teams of like I don't know, maybe three people. Three. How many you got? Uh, yeah, three, and there'll be one team. Four. I don't know cool. So three to four people. So group up with like three to four other people. Um, and what we're gonna do is just spend each team, uh, just kind of present to your customer who your customer is, or who you think they are, and um, or your user, and to the other team, to whoever else is in your group. And then I want you guys just to take a couple minutes and just brainstorm ideas to get in front of that customer, whether it be online or in person, different, uh, different ways. We'll take like maybe three to five minutes. Um, I'll set a timer, so I'll force you guys to do this. Um, so I'll give you an example. Candid is a product that I'm working on to help web developers collect feedback during the web development process. Some ways that I can get in front of web developers. I could go to SACJS, I could go to hackathons, hacker groups. I could go online, I could run ads. Like just generate as many ideas, even if they might not be feasible. You're trying to come up with as many as possible during brainstorming. I could run ads on things like Stack Overflow, which is just full of developers. Um, I could join Slack channels, which have a ton of developers. There's a lot of technical groups for developers. Um, I could cold email and cold call or go knock on the many small web shops, shops throughout Sacramento and say, hey, can I chat with you for a few minutes? Um, that's what we're kind of looking for, is you guys to just start riffing, start helping each other on coming up with as many possible ways you can get in front of your customer. Like, if you were in a van and you got dropped out in the midtown of Sacramento, like, right now, where would you go to get the answers and the interviews mm -hmm. that, like right now? Uh, or tomorrow morning. Love yeah. you. Whatever. Because <laughs> you said you picture that in your mind and that yeah. for the for the five minute break first. Yeah, you guys wanna take five, grab some extra pizza, another beer. Uh, I'll be up here if anybody has any questions and then we'll jump back into doing those uh, like brainstorming sessions. Cool? Yeah.
Yeah. Actually, the, my customer, my end customers are really, really hard to find the metal from. Uh, uh, is there a record button? Yeah. 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 Yeah.